Last week was Vision Sunday, and um, our senior pastors announced the direction and the theme for our church for 2023, and that theme is taking new ground. Someone say taking new ground. Taking new ground. And that all of our campuses would healthily grow, but not just, not all health is good growth. You have a growth coming out of your neck that's not good, but that we would grow in health. That as we get bigger, we also intentionally get smaller. That we are a church that is big enough to affect the world, but small enough to impact our families. Amen? And we prayed and we, we laid hands on our new staff members across all of our campuses as our staff begins to grow. It was an amazing, amazing Sunday. Not just focusing on what God has done in Wave Church, but looking towards what God is going to do in the future. Amen? And I want to continue this thought on taking new ground. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter one, and um, we'll start in verse one, but I'll set, I'll set the scene for you. Moses has led the Hebrew people out of slavery, um, but because of their disobedience and their lack of faith, instead of taking new ground that God had promised them, they wandered the desert for 40 years. And their consequence was that the majority of them would not see, nor, they would, step, nor would they step foot in the land that God has promised them. It's a powerful thought that people who put their trust in themselves instead of God will spend their entire lives wandering aimlessly. Isn't that true? Yeah. I could preach that, we ain't got time. <laughs> but as we, as we enter the, this, this scene that we're about to read, Moses has died, Joshua is now leading the people into the promised land and, uh, and taking new ground. Joshua was an amazing leader. In fact, he's considered one of the greatest military generals in human history, and under Moses' leadership, the Hebrew people wandered the desert for 40 years, but under Joshua's leadership, in seven years, he had conquered the entire land that God had called them to, 31 kings to be exact. Um, so if you're a Christian leader, start in Exodus and Joshua. It is fascinating. But Joshua was, was a faithful man. He was a courageous leader and a visionary who, who trusted not in his own vision, but in the God vision that uh, was given to him. And so in, in Joshua chapter 1, uh, verses 1, it says that after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead now then you and all of these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. Verse three, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. I love that verse. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be courageous and strong, uh, or strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Again, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it, the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Again, he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. I love that passage. Yes. Amen. It's a good passage. Yes. And so I, I have some thoughts. And my question this morning um, is what new ground has God called us to fight for in our lives? If we're going to take new ground, what new ground are we going to take in 2023? And uh, I have 30 points. Are you ready? Yeah. We're going to have our own revival right here yeah. with 30 points. I'm kidding. I've got five because I'm hungry. Um, but let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Well, Jesus, we love you. We worship you. Holy Spirit, you were here before we got here. You are here now, and you'll be here when we leave. And I pray that even during worship, God, you are doing heart surgery in your people. Yes. That Holy Spirit, we can make church about a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's about worshiping the one true king. Yes. I pray, God, you use me this morning. Speak to your people. And above all else, if people don't know you, they'll leave knowing you. If they already know you, God, as disciples, they'll... Leave knowing you more in Jesus' name. Amen? amen. And amen. All 
All right, turn to your neighbor and say, get ready, get ready, get ready. It's about to go down. Now, we may, we may not be the Israelites taking new ground in the promised land, but we are Christians who are meant to take a hold of the promises of God. And what I believe we can learn from, from, for God's call to Joshua is to take new ground in our own lives, but where? Where should we take new ground? Where, where are we meant to take new ground in our lives? And at C3 Conference, there was one more pastor who preached. He was an, uh, he was an 86-year-old Baptist preacher, been preaching for a very long time. He preached one of the greatest messages I've ever heard. And in that message, it, it seemed like just a few minutes you ever hear someone speaking and it's like they've been speaking for an hour, but it's only been, or it's, it feels like a few minutes, but it's been an hour. And as thousands of people, mainly pastors, leaned in on the edge of their seats as he spoke, um, he spoke on, on these disciplines that we're going to talk about today. And uh, if we fight for them, if we take new ground in them, it will take us to a whole nother level in our church, corporately, but also individually in our lives. So this is the question. In our lives, where should we be taking new ground? These points are very simple, um, but there's beauty and simplicity. You ready? Number one is this. Where should we be taking new ground? We should be taking new ground in worship. We should be taking new ground in worship. Worship comes from the old English uh, word uh, meaning worth. Someone say worth. Worth. Worship is is, is the quality of being worthy. When we praise God, we are declaring that no one and no thing is worthy of praise except the Lord. Worship has the power to change the atmosphere. Worship is faith enacted. What what makes us different from the Norva is that we have faith in here. Amen? Amen? We are worshiping the one true God. Even during worship this morning, I was reminded of how worship is meant to never leave us the same. What if every Sunday we didn't just walk in and out of habit or a Christian checklist, but we came expectant for God to move in our lives? In Ezekiel chapter 46, he writes about worship, and he says, uh, verse 9, But when the people of the land come before the Lord on appointed feast days, whoever enters by the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate. And whoever enters by the south gate shall go out by the north gate. He shall not return by the way uh, of the gate through which he came but shall go out through the opposite gate. Isn't that fascinating that God sets that standard, that they must leave a different way than they came in? How true is that of our worship? Worship should change something inside of us, that as we we come into the house of God, that we are expecting to leave different than we came in. Or has worship just become this thing that happens before the funny, relevant Christian TED Talk? Entertain me, pastor, right? And if you don't, I'll find another one that will. We're not meant to be consumers. We're meant to be priests. Someone should preach about that. When, when, I, when I read that, I can't help but think about my own worship. That when, when I think about great worshipers in the Bible, I think about women like Miriam who was as she watched her people finally freed from 430 years of slavery, she grabbed a tambourine. We're not bringing that back, but she grabbed a tambourine (laughs) and she danced and sang and praised God for the new ground they were stepping in. When I I worship, I wanna have courage like the woman with the issue of blood. When I worship, I wanna have thankfulness and honor like the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears. I want faith and determination Uh, like the men who brought their friend to Jesus at a house church meeting, ripping through the tiles of the roof so maybe, just maybe, their friend would be healed. In my worship, I want crazy faith like Peter to walk on the words of Jesus and have enough faith to come out on the water. The reason why we are reading about these people thousands of years later is because they were expectant and they took new ground in their faith in their worship. Expectancy changes everything about the way that we worship. Amen? Amen? You know, I'm sure as a Christian with the internet that you've, you've heard of what's going on in Wilmore, Kentucky, right? That the, they're calling it the, the Asbury Awakening, and it's happening at a Christian university. Uh, it's being described as, as the chapel service that didn't end. And hundreds of students and professors started worshiping, I think, 11 or 12 days ago, and, uh, and they haven't stopped. And, uh, and, and what's happening there is, I think, is special. And, 
across our nation, um, universities are starting to have these, these worship gatherings. And, um, and I'll tell you why I think it's special. I don't think, think it's special because it's going viral. And I don't think it's special because it's on TikTok or on Instagram, but because people are yearning for the real tangible yes. presence of God. Yes. It's special because people are worshiping, and it's special because you have college students coming in and repenting of their sins. Right. Not feeling sorry for their sins, right. but genuinely repenting, going, God, I need you. Yes. That's powerful. Yes. Amen. Amen. Does this mean now that we should rent a bus and all go to Wilmore, Kentucky? No. We don't need to chase revival because God is going to do what he wants to do in the hearts of people. It's funny, Christians, we always try to figure out God. Like, God, like this is is how we get revival sparked in our nation. God's going to do what he wants to do. He'll he'll do it at a university in Wilmore, Kentucky. He'll do it in Norfolk, Virginia. He'll do wherever. He'll do it on Azuzu Street. He'll do it through the Jesus Revolution, which I'm excited that movie's coming out. I love Chuck Smith. I can't wait to see it. But but God's going to do whatever he wants to do through his people. We just have to be open. We can't get in the way of the Holy Spirit. You know what I love about this new generation? Now, I can talk a lot about why I don't like Gen Z, all right? I can talk a lot about it. You know what I love about this new generation is that they are so hungry for a move of God. They are so sick of being lied to. They just want the truth. And they are being bombarded with the lie that their true worship is the worship of themselves. That they are defined by their sex and their gender and they should just lift up their emotions on the altar. It will lead them to freedom and they are finding out very quickly that it's all nonsense. And it's lies, and it only leads them to more confusion and more emptiness. They want the truth. I love that about them. Work ethic, we can talk about, right? But they want the truth. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. John 4, 23, Jesus is speaking. He says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Maybe that's what's happening. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. What does that mean? When we worship God, we worship him in truth. We live in a culture that is attacking objective truths, right? For example, easy one. There is a creator, and his name is God. Very easy truth, right? That is a truth and and one of the many reasons why we worship. Yet our cultural institutions spend lots of time and money battling that simple truth. So regardless of culture or what the world says, we are to worship the one true God. We worship him in truth. Everything that embodies the character and the perception of God is truth. In fact, the knowledge of God is truth. So that's truth. And then there is the spirit. Someone say the spirit. Spirit. This is where people tend to go a little bit left, right? Worshiping God in the spirit is engaging with your whole heart. When, When we worship him, heart and soul, aligning our hearts with his heart, uh, in, in a relationship with God, that is what God loves the most. He cares very little for ceremony and external acts, more than he cares for the heart and the alignment of our spirits with his, and, and our hearts with his heart. If you're all about truth but no spirit, you become mean. But you're all spirit and no truth, you become weird. Right? Truth without a mo- you, you ever invite someone to church? Be like, please help Sister So-and-so stay in her seat. I grew up in a church like that, people running around, all that. And, I, and I, I'm for the gifts of the Spirit. I love, I love all that. But truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy. But emotion without truth produces shallow Christians who are carried off by the wind of their feelings. Yes. True worship comes from people who are deeply emotional, but also deeply rooted in sound doctrine. Right. They are to be together, not separated, right? right? It's like the Reformed people are are beating up the Pentecostals, and the Pentecostals are saying the Reformed people have no faith. It's like, no, 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 it's supposed to be a middle ground. Now, I don't believe we have to go to Wilmore, Kentucky to find the presence of God. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is right here. And I'm for, if you want to drive there, you have time off work, go for it, right? I'm not opposed to that at all. But we can experience the presence of God right here, amen? It drives me crazy when people invite the Holy Spirit into a meeting. We don't invite Jesus into this place. He was here before we got here. Right. He's here now. He's, uh, he's omniscient, omnipresent. He'll be here when we're gone, right? You know what this 86-year-old Baptist preacher said that rattled me on what true, true worship is? He said, true worship is going to the cross ourselves. Mm-hmm. 
true worship is going to the cross ourselves. It's, it's dying to self. That's what true worship is. That our identity is not in our job or our gender or our race or our political or sexual preference. It is in our relationship with Jesus. Yes. And this year in 2023, both collectively and individually, I want to take new ground in our worship. Yeah. Will you do that with me? Yeah. We're going to take new ground in our worship. That when we come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it is not just our Christian checklist. It is not, oh, I, I got, you know what? My family's a little late. I got 15 minutes before the word gets there, before the, before the pastor gets on stage. Let's not think like that. Right. Let's go, I can't wait to get in the presence of God. Right. Lord, I need you. All of the things that are going in my brain and in my mind uh, uh, as, as a Christian in the world <laughs> throughout the week, I need this Sunday yeah. like never before, amen, yeah. to fill me up so I can be sent out to do the will of the Father, yeah. Amen. You know what's, what's, uh, what's cool is I've been talking with the, so there's a Methodist church that is over 100 years old that's behind our building, and they have about five or six members left. And, um, and I talked to, the, to the, uh, the rector that's there, the pastor, and I said, hey, would it, would it be cool if I brought our church into your church and we just did a worship night? Wouldn't that be cool? And she was like, absolutely. She goes, honestly, the Holy Spirit hasn't been here a while. It'd be great if he came back. That's what she said. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I was like, oh, we're going to do it. If, if, I, if I did it, would you come? Yeah. All right, we're going to do it. If you don't show up, I'm going to be mad. We're going to do it anyway. But we'll see what happens. I reckon worship hasn't filled that 800-seat auditorium in a long time. I think we could fill it with worship and with praise. I just love, it's kind of a romantic idea of, of taking on something that the devil thinks is dead, bringing the Holy Spirit back into it. I don't know. So let's take ground in our worship. The second thing is let's take ground in study. You know, Joshua 178 says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. You can't obey a law that you don't know. Isn't that true? Do not turn from it for the right of, to the right or the left, that they may be successful wherever you go. You may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Is that convicting for some of you? Some of you know music lyrics more than you know scripture. I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and success successful. See, the world says that success comes in a certain way. But the Bible says, keep the word on your lips day and night. Meditate on it. That's how you become prosperous and successful. Interesting. Psalm 119 says that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. We live in dark days. You know, interesting about walking in the dark, you bump into things. But when there's a light, you can see. Stop you from stumbling. You know, studying the word of God is a discipline we cannot afford to devalue. And in 2023, I want our church to take new ground in study and in revelation and in understanding the true word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, that it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. You ever, you, you ever have a thought or feel strongly about something and you're like, I don't know if this is right. The writer of Hebrews says, well, put it up against the word of God and it'll cut right through it. It'll tell you, it will reveal to you the truth. Amen? We love worship. We are moved by the gifts of the spirit and miracles, but we are just as passionate and zealous about sound doctrine. You know what's a fascinating statistic? Fascinating. You would think in our current American political climate, the most, that most of our politicians wouldn't necessarily identify with a religion, right? Maybe they're Christians on the low. Like, they, they, they're not vocal about it. 
Um, but you know, they just recently did a poll, and you know what the percentage of House and Senate wrote down, this is all of Congress, wrote down that they identify as Christian? Do you know what percentage? I asked Alyssa, my wife, and she was like, uh, maybe 30%. I was like, oh, that's a good guess. She's like, maybe, maybe 50. Do you know what the percentage is? 88%. That's nearly nine out of 10 members of Congress in America identify as Christian. Doesn't that blow your mind? It absolutely, I'm like, that's not a real statistic. It is 100% real. They just did the poll like two months ago. So what it tells us is that either our politicians are pathological liars, right? Which could be true. Or they don't know anything about the word that they claim is the foundation of their life. Amen. And what we are seeing now, and I prophesy what we will see in our future, is public figures misquoting scripture to push an agenda that is so far from the truth. And a lot of Christians will fall for it. Why? Because they don't read their Bibles. I am so passionate about Christians reading the word of God and studying and seeking the truth for themselves. Just don't take my word for it. I could be lying to you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Ephesians 5.15 says, be careful then how you live, yes. not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God, the will of the Lord is for our lives. Do you know where you find the will of God for your life? In the word of God. Yes. Some of us are searching for a voice when we should be searching for a verse. Almost every person I sit down with who's struggling with the will of God for their lives almost always is not reading their Bibles for themselves. I used to live in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in Ghent, um, and uh, most of my neighbors were Orthodox Jews. Uh, and my neighbor had 10 kids with one on the way. Um, he's a rabbi, and uh, apparently don't have cable, you know? And so uh, <laughs> 11 kids. I'm over here like, three is a lot. He had 11. 11 kids. And one of them was named Yurak Miel. It means God will have mercy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a Jewish name. And, and he was seven years old. He has memorized half of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Every day, they are required to sing it. Every day three times a day, for their entire lives. I bet you if I went around the room and said, what's your favorite Bible verse? Let me all be, uh, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. <laughs> True statement, not a verse, <laughs> right? <laughs> Should have sold cars or something. You know, you know we cannot, as followers and disciples of Jesus, make wise decisions that our families, our workplaces, and our world are so in dire need of without knowing the word. Yes. This is why Ephesians 6.12 says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Right. I That's cannot right. punch fear in the face. Mm -hmm. I, cannot, I cannot wrestle in the natural with gender ideology, right? We, we have to, we, we battle it with the word of God, yeah. right? And that is our power against temptation. That when, when Jesus was put in the desert and tempted by the devil, the first thing he did was quote scripture. And that is what we are called to do. If you want to be strong against the temptation of the enemy, then you must get into the word of God. Study this thing. Hide it away in your heart. So when temptation comes, you have the ability to overcome it. There are too many American Christians who do not read their Bible. It's so easy. Download the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app. Go to the plans. There's a little button, plans, press it and click. Uh, you can do multiple read the Bible in a year plans. And for 10 minutes a day, you will have read the entire Bible in 365 days. Amazing, right? But hey, hey Pastor, I ain't, just got, I ain't got enough time. Okay. Your life's falling apart. Got time? I don't know, maybe. I love what D.L. Moody said. He says, I never saw a useful Christian who was not a student of the Bible. Amen. Let's seek new ground in seeking God. Number three, we're going to take new ground in prayer. Let's take new ground in prayer. Yes. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. Okay, Paul. Instead, pray about everything. Yes. 
Well, shut up, Paul. <laughs> Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. He's giving us a roadmap to prayer. Right. Then you'll experience God's peace. He says, keep thanking him until you experience God's peace. Yes. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Right now, there are millions of Christians across the world praying for those affected by the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. I was praying for them this week. Um, I have a friend there now who's been DMing me pictures, and it's just so sad. You know, the death toll has eclipsed officially last night 46,000 people. Wow. An unfathomable tragedy. And, and even in the midst of tragedy and chaos, they are experience, experiencing unbelievable miracles. Yeah. Muslims, Muslim countries. Um, they are... They are still finding children and families in the rubble days after the earthquake. It's fascinating. In fact, they rescued a newborn baby with the umbilical cord attached to the mother who had died along with the entire family in the house. But by some miracle, this little baby survived. Her name is Aya. They named her Aya, which means uh, miracle or sign from God in Arabic. Isn't that beautiful? miracle. You know, there is, there is joy in the midst of pain. Yeah. And, and these children that they are rescuing, for some reason, it's, it's a bunch of kids who are staying alive through all of this. And uh, they are, they, when they are being rescued, there are stories circulating that they are telling the rescuers, because they're asking, how did you survive for set nine days? And they are saying a man in white kept them warm during the freezing nights. Mm-hmm. Now, as Muslims, they may not know who that man in white is, but as Christians, we're crazy enough to believe in angels and in Jesus Christ, that man in white. Amen? Amen. Out of this deep tragedy, they are experiencing miracles. And you know, as I was listening to this 86-year-old Baptist preacher, he used this analogy And he said, you know, the way that they're finding these people under the rubble is that they are drilling holes and lowering down these listening devices. And what they're looking for and listening intently for is scratching or knocking so that maybe if they hear something, they can begin to dig through the rubble to rescue the people. But then he asked a question. He asked, in the rubble and the confusion and the chaos of people's lives, As Christians, have we stopped listening intently to the cries of those who are desperately in need of the saving love of Jesus? Can you even hear them anymore? And I sat in the second row, and I wept. Because we can make Christianity about a lot of things. Even as pastors, we can make it about likes and follows and views. We can make church about a lot of things our pet projects, but really, it's about one thing, and that is being led to the feet of Jesus ourselves and in turn leading others to the feet of Jesus. That is our goal. Our goal as Wave Church is to get heaven to party. Why? Because heaven rejoices over one saved soul and 99 righteous people. One of the most humble things in the human heart we can do is pray because prayer is our mind acknowledging to our spirit that, God, you are in control. Amen? Amen. You want to stay soft to the things of God and hear his voice? Pray. Continue to pray. Pray when you don't want to. Isn't it amazing how you don't want to pray? I don't ever want to pray. Never. I'm a pastor. I'm your pastor. I don't ever want to pray. I'm like, I'd rather watch Netflix, right. right? The new Survivor came out. I'd rather watch that. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to pray, but when I get into the presence of God, my goodness, do I never regret it. The Holy Spirit goes, son, I'm so glad you are here. I got something to tell you. Preach this. <laughs> don't put that person in leadership. Put that person in leadership. Number four is this. The band can come on up, and I'm done. I want to take new ground in my giving. Some of y'all are like, dang it. <laughs> Didn't think we were going to talk about giving today. 
Malachi 3.10 says it's the most popular, most popular giving verse in the Bible. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do this, says the Lord, this is what he said, the Lord of heaven's armies. Do we realize how powerful God is? He reminds us, no, 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 it's not just the Lord. He's not just a king. He's the king of heavenly armies. You know it was one angel that wiped out the firstborn in Egypt? Imagine thousands of them. He goes, that, he's, that's his army. I will open the windows of heaven for you, for you. I will pour out blessings so great that you won't even have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops, and we never read verse 11. Your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. You will be naturally, supernaturally protected. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they arrive, says the Lord. He says again, of heaven's armies. It's powerful. Ask the nations of this world who are the most blessed countries and they will say Christian nations. That's why they hate Christianity so much. Now we can debate on whether or not America is a Christian nation, sure. But there's a reason why the devil wants us to forget who we are and worship ourselves. It's because we stop being like God and that is sacrificial. Come on church, let's take ground in our giving this year. You know what's amazing is I didn't even look until the very last month of our, our, like our church's Wave, Wave Church Norfolk's giving records. I didn't really look. Um, I just was kind of charging with doing the ministry and c- community groups and all of that and preaching. And I looked at, the, at our giving records. And it, it, last year was the greatest giving that we've ever seen in the history of our church on the back of a pandemic. Isn't that amazing? Yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I want our church to be disciples of Jesus that just go, God, I'm gonna give you my whole life, even 10% of my gross income. And I know not, the stats say not everyone tithes. And I know that we're all on a journey and I'm not gonna kick you out of the church. I don't even look at your giving records. It's the business manager. He does. <laughs> but ultimately, God watches the offering plate go by. He does online too. He does online giving too. <laughs> and I just want to be, I, I want to I listen to the Holy Spirit. And even when it's really hard, and I know for a lot of families right now, it's really hard. I've got three kids. It's hard. Grocery bills have doubled. Inflation's real, right? But I refuse. I will always put God first. My, always, I will refuse. I will go into debt putting God first. Amen. Amen. Number five is this. Taking new ground in fellowship. Hebrews 5, Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds and good works, not neglecting meeting together as, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as the day is drawing near. You know, we're about to go online. I'm, my goal is to, to, I've been, if you're new, I've been raging against going online, mainly because I'm like, you should be in church, Right? I felt the Holy Spirit go, okay, are you done? You done having a pity party about people staying at home and watching church? Like, I want you to go online. And, and so we're buying all of the equipment and we'll be going like on, on you know, all the major platforms, hopefully in April. Um, and, and we obviously have an online campus for our Great Net campus, which is amazing. It has a team and all of that. Most of ours will be volunteers. Um, but online church is great. Love it, but it's only a supplement. It will not sustain you. You know, the gathering of the saints in person, that is God's idea of community. And we were never meant to do this life alone. We were never meant to do this life online. Amen. Amen. I'll make the supplement for you. I'll shake up the protein shake for you, right? (laughs) But, But we're meant to do this life together in person, looking at each other face to face. I love Pam's story. She's, she was actually here before I was. Like she's, she was here um, with Pastor Teddy, like just serving. She started Downtown Divas back then. And what I love about her story is she goes, when I was going through it, 
the church was with me every step of the way. They clean my toilets. This is the thing. It's because we're family. And so let's take new ground in fellowship. And for some of you who are new and you're like, well, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to take the risk, right, of relationship because it's awkward and it could get weird and people are going to get to know me and then I'm going to get offended by somebody. That's called life. Have you ever been offended by your family members? Right? I am the father of this house, I guess. I get offended by people all the time. Right? But we're family. We're meant to do this life together. Amen? This is what I love about God. God is kind. Most of all, he's patient. I am grateful for a Lord that is patient with me. Amen? But what I love about God's kindness is that he is so kind that it leads me to repentance. Yeah. 